What does it mean to be called crazy in a crazy world? Listen to Madness Radio, Voices and Visions from Outside Mental Health. Tuesdays, 4 to 5 p.m. Eastern on Pacifica Affiliates, WXOJLPFM, Northampton, Massachusetts, and KWMD in Kasilof and Anchorage, Alaska. Produced by Freedom Center and the Icarus Project, streaming, podcasting, and archived at madnessradio.net. Welcome to Madness Radio. This is your host, Will Hall. And uh, today we have Gracelyn Guile. Um, Gracelyn is a uh, someone who's been diagnosed with bipolar disorder, and she's the author of a really interesting and helpful book called Healing Depression and Bipolar Disorder Without Drugs, Inspiring Stories of Restoring Mental Health Through Natural Therapies. So we're going to be talking with Gracelyn about um, holistic health and uh, how to use natural therapies um, for your mental wellness. So, Gracelyn, thanks a lot for joining us today on Madness Radio. Hi, Will. Thank you. And you're in, uh, you're in Connecticut, is that right? I am. I'm in Stonington, Connecticut. Well, it's great to have you on the show. We talk a lot about um, natural healing and alternative medicine and natural therapy and holistic health, and it's good to have some time to go in-depth um, on this uh, subject. And one of the reasons that I, I like uh, your book and I wanted to have you on the show is that you're not a doctor. Uh, you're someone who's actually been um, been diagnosed and um, you have been able to uh, find your recovery without medications and using natural therapy. So tell us you know, how this kind of all started for you. How did you um, end up getting a bipolar diagnosis? Well, I'd had depression on and off from my teenage years forward. Um, And so I went to a doctor and he said, well, you're just having hypoglycemia. You know, when your blood sugar gets low, you feel depressed. So eat snacks and protein more frequently. So for the next few years, I happily grazed, but um, it didn't end the depression. And uh, it wasn't until I just thought when life got a little overwhelming that I couldn't cope and I'd get depressed. Um, But in 1993, uh, when I was in my 40s, uh, a therapist picked up on the manic highs between the depressive lows. And it it was just excessive energy and uh, unrealistic expectations, but it never got out of hand. And nobody else had picked up on it. So I was diagnosed in 93 as bipolar 2. And I was, um, my mother, interestingly, was bipolar, had been all of her life, and she'd taken lithium, and I saw what it did to her, and that it didn't help her that much. So I refused, and I was put on an antidepressant. What, um, you said that she was on lithium and what it did to her. What did did you see that it had done to her? Oh, she, it it was a flattening of her emotions. Um, My mother had a wonderful chuckle and happiness, and that sort of disappeared. And she gained uh, weight, and she had dry mouth, and she just, um, you know, it it dampened everything down, and it slowed everything down, which, of course, is what it does. Uh, it, It impacts the thyroid and slows everything down. And she died of Parkinson's disease, ultimately, which uh, some doctors believe is a side effect of lithium. So um, I just said, I'm not even going to go there because it didn't, it didn't stop what was going on. It just uh, dampened everything down. So I um, was put on an antidepressant in 93. Uh, life was less chaotic. And so I wasn't unhappy taking the drug. But in 1994 and 95, I started growing breast cysts and tumors so rapidly, I had surgery twice in 12 months. And every time they'd cut them out, more would just grow back in. And I thought, well, I can't have surgery every six months for the rest of my life. So I um, started looking for what was causing this sudden growth of tumors, and they were benign, so I had time to figure it out. Uh, And it turned out I did a a two-year process of elimination, systematically eliminating every toxin I could think of. And it finally came down to the only toxin I was still taking in was the antidepressant. Now, you had never had um, problems with uh, cysts before. 
No, I had not. It was sudden and dramatic. And so... What was the antidepressant that you were on? It was Wellbutrin. Wellbutrin. And so I decided that um, my brain chemistry had never been life-threatening, but cancer might be. And so I tapered off the drug. And within um, two months, my latest tumor disappeared and all the growth stopped. And that was pretty shocking to me because no one had ever, ever mentioned that these antidepressants could trigger cancer, although in my book I found some, several small studies that show that they do. Now, this was in 1994, did you say? Uh, well, the cysts and tumors started in 94. I actually stopped them in 99 by the time I'd gone through the surgeries and then the, started to uh, try and figure out the underlying trigger of the tumors. So in the fall of 99 uh, was when I stopped the tumors. And so then I thought I celebrated feeling like I'd sidestepped cancer. But then I... Uh, thought, well, what am I going to do about my brain? And so I just decided I was not going to do those medications. If I could figure out what was causing the cysts and tumors and halt them, maybe I could figure out what was causing my brain to malfunction and stop that. That's, a, that's an oh. amazing story. So you, um, you really, on your own, you didn't have any kind of help or support suggesting that the antidepressant, the Wellbutrin, was causing the tumors, but just as a process of elimination, you kind of came to that conclusion yourself. And then well, you I had two clues. Uh, when I developed the, the tumor that disappeared, I'd had it biopsied by a cancer clinic outside of Boston to see if it was malignant, and it was benign. But while I was there, I said to the doctor, you see women with breast cancer all the time. Have you casually observed that uh, they have more breast cancer. And he said, we haven't looked at that, but we have casually observed that they have more breast discharge. So we know these drugs are impacting the breast tissue. And before that, I'd asked my psychiatrist who prescribed the drug to check the clinical trials of Wellbutrin. And it showed that they had caused an increased incidence of mammary tumors in the mice but the mice were being given 9,000 times the amount a human would be given by weight. And so those results were deemed inconclusive. So looking at those two clues was what made me decide that um, it was worth, you know, you can always go back on the drug, uh, to go off the drug and see what happened. Now, Grace, and, you, um, you really took a tremendous personal initiative and you did all this research and were very thoughtful um, about it and educated yourself, and that's what I think is really interesting about your your book, your book and your work. What kind of background do you have that kind of led you to have this critical, independent thinking approach to your own um, your own healthcare? Because obviously, you weren't just doing what the doctors were telling you. No, I wasn't, and I think by nature, um, I've always been a little bit of a rebel. You know, I'm sort of in the '60s generation where we don't take. Um, the, the word of the government or any big organization as fact. We sort of are independent thinkers. And um, my husband says I have a stubborn gene. Um, and I tell him, no, I'm, I'm merely persistent. Um, but I am a very independent person, and I love to read. And so I just said, I think that if I can stop cysts and tumors, there must be something I can do with my brain, but I couldn't find a single psychiatrist or even a research center at first. Um, you know, I called John Hopkins, where I know they've done brain chemistry research center, and the conventionally trained doctors almost hung up on me. They were uninterested, totally wrote me off as a bipolar person who was wacko and wouldn't even talk to me. And I couldn't find a doctor, so I started reading. And I came across independent, well-trained doctors who had written books, um, and particularly one, Dr. Carl Pfeiffer, who had a clinic in New Jersey in the um, 80s, early 80s, and he treated schizophrenia holistically. Now, is that the orthomolecular medicine approach? Yes. 
Mm. And but I had never heard that word before, and I just knew that I'd found his books. So I read a couple of his books, and then I went looking for Dr. Pfeiffer, and I couldn't find him. There was no clinic anymore in New Jersey, but I found a clinic called Pfeiffer Treatment Center outside of Chicago. So I contacted them, and they too have been treating all brain chemistry disorders just using vitamins, minerals, and amino acids since 1989. And their director, uh, Dr. William Walsh, had collaborated with Dr. Pfeiffer, uh, who unfortunately Dr. Pfeiffer died in 1989, and that's why I couldn't find him. Now, Grace, let me let me back up just a second. So you, it sounds like you were recommended to um, to be on lithium, and then because of your own experience seeing what it had done to your mom, you decided to go on Wellbutrin um, instead, which is itself is a really interesting story because a lot of doctors would say, well, actually, you know, you need something heavier than Wellbutrin, and Wellbutrin is an antidepressant. It's not going to help you as much, but you really asserted yourself and you decided, no, I don't want the the lithium. And then it sounds like the Wellbutrin was helpful, um, but uh, but the, because of the problems with the tumors, you um, went off of it. Now, when you went off of it slowly, which is also a smart thing to do is to taper off of it. Did you have, you had a recurrence of the difficulties that had brought you to um, get on the medication in the beginning? Is that right? Um, I did. Um, the mania came back and the depression came back because um, I wasn't doing anything for it. And when you use alternatives, the same thing will happen. Whatever you're using to end the symptoms, be it a drug or be it um, vitamins and minerals, you have to continue that or the symptoms will come back. And so, um, so this, but my symptoms had never been life-threatening and I had always been able to function, but as I got older, they got more pronounced and I was struggling more to function. And stress can also make your symptoms dramatically worse because the stress hormones are pouring in and um, adding to the mix. So I went off of it and I went, put myself under the care of a psychiatrist who had absolutely no belief in what I was doing. But I said, if I get in trouble, I want you to monitor me so that um, I'm not endangering myself. And he agreed to do that. And then I went looking for, for other solutions. It's amazing how, how just systematic and methodical you were in, in doing this. And it's, it's great that you are working with other people now and you've written this book. So when you started to, you started to do the ortho, orthomolecular therapy, is that right? What, what did you start doing? Well, I went to the clinic, the Pfeiffer Treatment Center uh, in Chicago, and they identified two genetic disorders that I had and told me how to compensate for them with... Um, vitamins and minerals and um, amino acids. And within four months of starting their vitamin and mineral therapy, my mania disappeared. It stopped. And that was really interesting to me because the depression continued. So the two were different, two different syndromes. Uh, and, and so then the depression continued for another 15 months and it was because it was no longer interrupted by the mania, it was very hard to live with. And I became borderline suicidal for the first time in my life. And, um, but I just, the stubborn gene kicked in and I just refused to give up. And I just said, I am going to figure this out. And when I could not help myself, um, I say that the universe provided an answer because um, a total stranger called me from Kentucky, checking out the um, Pfeiffer Treatment Center because I'd given them permission to give out my name and phone number. And he said his wife was stuck in mania. And I said, well, they ended my mania really quickly, but they haven't been able to figure out what was causing my depression. And he said, oh, there's new research out, and it's f using fish oils uh, with a um, doctor at Harvard did clinical trials using fish oils with bipolar patients with great success, and his book is just out. So I ordered the book, but because I'd been on this health regimen for three years now as a result of the 
tumors that issue. I was taking fish oils, 1,000 milligrams a day, because they're really good for your, uh, your brain, your heart, your skin, your digestion. And in the clinical trials, they used 10 grams a day, but in the book, Dr. Stoll um, said he thought five grams would be enough. And today, the accepted, this was before this was widely known, the accepted dosage for bipolar and, de and depressed patients is now three to five grams a day of fish oils. Yeah, I have to but really I, agree with you on the, on the fish oils. I mean, I, that's one of the cornerstones of my own holistic um, self-care is, um, you know, drinking my cod liver oil <laughs> every, every morning. It sounds kind of nasty, but, um, you know, really high doses, um, of fish oil have been really helpful in getting my own balance and my own head together. And, and so I'm, you mentioned that you started this vitamin, mineral, and amino acid, um, therapy with the clinic that you connected with. What, what exactly were you, you taking that had such a dramatic immediate effect in, um, in getting rid of what you were experiencing as, as mania? Well, I was taking, when you are diagnosed, when you have, there's four genetic triggers that have been known since the 1960s that are very commonly known, except by conventional medicine that doesn't want to go there. But it's pyroluria, overmethylation, undermethylation, and metal metabolism. And what these are, except for pyroluria, which I'll talk about in just a minute, the, the last three are errors of metabolism, and they can be compensated for using specific amino acids. Um, for the metal metabolism, people don't throw off metals, so they take amino acids that help them detoxify. For the over and under methylation, methylation is a biochemical process that happens in your body a million times a minute. Every cell does it. And if you over methylate, you take some things, which I talk about in the book, and if you undermethylate, which I did, I take methionine, 500 milligrams, one capsule of methionine a day to compensate for that genetic disorder. The pyroluria, when your body produces the red blood hemoglobin, you produce a molecule called the cryptopyro molecule. Now, normally that's not a problem. The body just dumps what it doesn't need in the urine and it's gone. But in this disorder, you overproduce the cryptopyral molecule and it has a chemical affinity for zinc and B6. So they're attracted and bond onto that molecule and when your body dumps the excess, you're being stripped of vitamin B6 and zinc. So all of my life I had been zinc deficient because of this. Zinc and copper are the two metals that we need in our body for health. You know, they get tested when you get your blood test. And they hold each other in balance. And if you have not enough zinc, your copper elevates. And elevated copper causes mania and violence, anxiety. And so it's very simple, except it's not simple. <laughs> and so I just take... 100 milligrams of zinc a day, knowing that my body dumps most of it because that's way be, that would cause a zinc overload in a normal person. So these four, uh, I covered those four um, genetic causes in my book, and you can now get tests for them. And um, and if people want to get a pencil and paper, I'll give some websites at the end of this so that they can do that. That would be great, and I, you know, I, I also have to agree with the, um, the my personal experience uh, with the B vitamins, amino acids, and zinc, because um, that's been very helpful um, for me. Just taking that that supplement, and you know, I've, there have been times in my life when I've stopped taking it, and I immediately notice mm -hmm. that my wellness um, goes down. Now, I'm I, there's a lot a lot going on here, and I guess I kind of want to talk about. Um, I know that there's more to your your story, and I want to hear that but i want to talk about a, a couple things one is just the whole experience of being overwhelmed <laughs> because mm -hmm. uh um, right. there are books out there and your book is is really good and it really gets to the um to the heart of the of the matter um but there are a lot of books out there that just there it's like going to the yellow pages and just having a thousand supplements that you need to take and all these different conflicting 
theories and perspectives and you know trying to get a handle on um the different functions of the the brain and the body and how this supplement works or how that works and so that's one of the things i want to talk a little bit about is that experience of how you know you find a practitioner and how you you get a handle on your own health care and and um, the other thing i wanted to to mention is it sounds like you were able to find people that you trusted and they were able to do this testing and you're talking about a genetic um, causality and that's a, a, a huge discussion we've done a lot of of work on that on the show and we've talked to a number of people and I would encourage people to to listen to an interview that, that we did with Jay um, Jay Joseph about um, genetics but we're not talking about genes as kind of like the you're just destined to have this it's like having blue eyes or something we're talking about a much more complicated view and, and please correct me if I'm wrong because you've you've studied this um, a more complicated view of genes where genes are kind of like a storehouse of possibility and they get turned on or turned off based on the environmental interactions and so it's less of a blueprint model and more of a dynamic model with the environment is is that right it's true that um, diet and um, pollutions um, all of these things impact the genes, and what they're learning is that you can have a genetic tendency, but it may not get turned on if you have adequate nutrition. And so um, what I have evolved that's not taught, covered in the book is, is a simple way of looking at this that's, that I've dubbed it Sherlock's process, and it's a healing process where the first thing you do is you look at adding the nutrients that the body must have to function. And then you next look at all the possible causes and eliminate whatever might be triggering the problem because those can be environmental toxins, it can be a lack of sleep, it can be any number of prescriptions that you're taking. And then the third thing, after you deal with those two basic categories of causal factors, then you start looking at maybe some emotional factors because they're the other thing that can trigger bipolar and uh, depression and anxiety are emotional trauma, you know, rape, incest, war, things that have a huge emotional impact. Um, so those are the th three segments that I suggest people look at, and I call it Sherlock's process because you just look at trying – uh, to explore and detect um, what the body needs, what you need to eliminate, and then other potential underlying causes. Yeah, I really like that. It's a very pragmatic approach because, I mean, I, I, I couldn't um, recommend to everyone that they do X, Y, or Z because people do have different experiences. I've, I've had um, friends and people that I know who have gone to holistic health people and done a lot of different kinds of supplements. They've gone to naturopaths or they've gone to acupuncturists and tried a lot of the things that have really helped me and they don't help them. And so there right. is there is a real diversity and there's a real mystery here. And I, I don't think either one of us are saying, hey, everybody, just go do orthomolecular and that's going to solve your, your problems. I mean, I think it's worth trying, but I think there's a lot of different things that are worth trying. And ultimately, it is like a Sherlock Holmes process. It's an, it's an exploration and experimental, pragmatic thing of finding out what is helpful for people because sometimes it's not even the, the holistic health thing at all. It's a, an emotional problem. They've got to get out of an abusive family situation or it's a poverty issue. If they can just get back on their feet with housing and a job, um, having some stability, then the stress changes and things start to unlock um, for the person. So I really like the pragmatic, pragmatic approach that you're, you're taking with this. What I have is, um, what I'd like to give to your audience is a few of things that I call brain basics on where to start, where everybody should start, because even if they don't have a brain chemistry disorder, their whole, um, their whole body is going to be improved. The interesting thing is that we're used to thinking of the side effects of drugs, and they're primarily negative. 
um, other than, you know, if they stop the, the mood disorders, but then you have all these other side effects that creep in. But when you're using this healing process, we call them side benefits because whatever you're doing to encourage the healing of your brain and the recovery of your mind, your mental stability, you have, you're also healing the rest of your body because a cell is a cell is a cell. And so everything is connected. And when you're working to restore your mind, you will also improve your health. Yeah, I really like that. It goes to the heart of what holistic health is all about, that it's all connected and it's about the whole being um, being healthy or, or not. I have to mention, I, I want to hear the seven um, brain basics that you've um, developed, but I have to mention because I think I'll get into trouble with my listeners if I don't. Um, you know, the whole question of, you know, does someone have a bipolar disorder? Is it a disorder? Is it a brain chemistry caused um, problem? This is very controversial, and you know, there's a lot of claims that the pharmaceutical companies will make. You have a chemical imbalance that's in your brain. You've got to take this medication, and we know that it's just not that simple, and it's often a reflection of of marketing. And so, I think when you're when you're talking about disorder, I'm hearing something about the whole being being out of balance or some kind of larger um, problem. And, um, you know, I'm, I, I don't want people to get hung up on, you know, the, the language, but really focus on the, the practical yes. application of this. And then the other thing, we were mentioning this um, before we, we started the interview, but the whole thing of focusing on the brain itself is, is, a, is problematic because, we know that the mind is really related to the whole body. Like the gut, for example, is is very important in mood and consciousness and feelings. And can you say a little bit about that so that we don't have kind of like too narrow understanding of what we're talking about? Everything is connected. And of course, the job of the marketers in the drug industry is to sell more drugs. So they've begun to, and they've been wildly successful. So they've now begun to find everybody has a brain chemistry disorder. You know, I hear them giving antidepressants to children who are too shy. Well, what's too shy and what's this problem? So they're basically calling every um, uh, idiosyncrasy of the personality some kind of disorder, and I think it's a bunch of rot. And I have a, um, you know, a, I was a PR person and I have a marketing background, so I know exactly what they're doing. They're divvying up the market share and expanding market share by going into children and, and going in all these other directions. So that's what companies do. But you have to decide if you want them to do that to you and get you on a drug for the rest of your life if you don't need it. And so what I'm talking about is let's address the physical causes of any kind of energetic disorder first. Let's do the brain basics and see how you feel. And then look at what's left. If you still have emotional issues, then um, you know there are other therapies that can correct the brain waves that result the patterns that have resulted from trauma or other issues. So you have lots of choices, but a patient has to become like a general contractor to rebuild your health. Because if you go to uh, most doctors, they're just going to put you on a drug in 10 minutes and send you out the door of the prescription, and you're going to take that drug for the rest of your life. And so you have to sort of take charge and say, I'm going to rebuild my health. I'm going to find the practitioners that know how to do this. And I'm going to hire those kinds of practitioners to help me get to where I want to go. So I really encourage patients to do what I did and to take charge. You don't have to do it all yourself and you don't have to know everything yourself, but you do have to make it clear to the practitioners you go to I want to do this, and I want you to help me do this. Can you do so? And I would, I would add to that. I think this is why it's so important to develop community around yourself because, I mean, you and your story, you were, had a tremendous amount of um, personal initiative and a real attitude of taking charge of your health. But a lot of people, it's just so overwhelming, and it's really mm -hmm. difficult to do on your own. And that's one of the things that we do at the Freedom Center and one of the reasons that we're so strongly promoting 
peer self-help groups and support groups so that you can find like-minded people around you to help you navigate your way through this so it's you're getting the help of the people around you it's not just you alone so let's get to the to the brain basics the seven brain basics okay. that you mentioned before the first one is diet and people uh americans eat a really sad diet it's called the standard american diet sad sad because it has way too much um junk in it and too little nutrition and so what people want to do is make their diet uh, a lot of carbs from vegetables not processed foods so you're trying to avoid things in a box things in a can uh, and go to the fresh um, produce counter and buy things that are fresh green and alive because that's where the nutrition comes in and you want things that are very colorful because that's nature's way of indicating different nutrients. So you want reds and yellows and lots of greens. You're listening to Madness Radio, and today our show is on restoring mental health through natural therapies. We have author Gracelyn Guile on the line from Connecticut. Her book is Healing Depression and Bipolar Disorder Without Drugs. And then you want four to six ounces of protein a day and you can I choose not to eat red meat because of all the additives that are fed uh, a lot of meat cat, cattle but I eat poultry that is organic I eat fish once or twice a week I eat soy and I eat beans whole grains except I have celiac disease and we'll talk about allergies in a second and so I can't eat um, some grains but I eat brown rice and you want dairy products but organic so that you're not getting the growth hormones that are fed to the cows of unorganic things and you want four to nine vegetables a day two or three fruits of different colors and good fats now, the easiest way to get that many vegetables is to have a big salad at lunch or to have a salad at dinner or to have soup, vegetable soups. You can figure it out, but this is, this is what you want to do to get all the nutrients that the body needs to function. Do the best you can. Some people say, oh, I can't possibly do that. All I'm saying is do the best you can, but understand that what you take in is the fuel that all of your cells, including your brain cells, have to use to function. And you wouldn't think of putting sugar water in a Porsche, but yet that's what people are feeding their body and expecting this much more uh, intricate organism to function on. So cut out the sugar, um, cut out the caffeine, and give your body nutrients. So the diet is important. Fats, you talked about fats, I talked about fats. These are good fats. The omega-3 fatty acids, which are the fish oils, but they're also found in some greens. Purslane is a green that is the highest in the omega-3s, and it's the ninth most common weed in the world. What is what is that? Say that Purslane, again. Purslane, P-U-R-S-L-A-N-E, and it is a, a sort of a succulent, weedy thing that grows here in Connecticut, grows along the roadsides, and uh, it's... Um, very high in the omega-3s. Fish oils is probably the easiest. Eat fish, but not more than twice a week because our waters are so polluted that most fish have a lot of mercury and PCBs. And if your body doesn't throw them off properly, then they can accumulate and short-circuit your brain. So um, the best way to get the omega-3s is flaxseed oil, fish oils, um, you can do some cod liver oil, but uh, I wanted to say Dr. Stoll said to be careful about taking two therapeutic levels of cod liver oil because you might get too much vitamin A. And um, I have, there are specific fish oils that I'm going to give a website at the end uh, for that are specifically formulated for people with brain chemistry disorders. So they're a little more... Um, they react a little more quickly. Then um, 
So that's number two is good fats. But you also want to cut out the, fat, the bad fats because the body uses the fat you take in to make all of your cell membranes. And the bad fats, the hydrogenated fats, the trans fats, make your cell membranes stiffer so the cells can't communicate as, as readily. And they've discovered that when they were doing MRIs of people with depression, that their um, cells are stiffer and less responsive. Um, now, it's important number. to be careful with the fish oil, too, because some of the cheaper um, fish oils may also have contaminants in them. Is that is that right? That's right. Look at the back label. Make sure on the back label it says they've been filtered for mercury and other contaminants. Um, also, if the fish oils give you fishy burps, it means that they may not be very fresh. They may be rancid. And so buy a different brand and make sure to keep them in the refrigerator when, uh, when you're not using them. Fish oils are, have a little bit of vitamin E in them to help stabilize it, but they're an unstable oil. But the body absolutely must have them, and, and we, the body can't make them. You can only get them through diet. And the American diet has loads of omega-6s, way too many omega-6s, which are the safflower oil, the sunflower oil, and um, saturated fats from chicken meat, things like that. And the omega-3s, there's practically none in the American diet. So it's real important to, you do need good fat um, because the body uses fat to make all your hormones. So don't go on a no-fat diet. Cut out the bad fats, put in the good omega-3 fats, and um, your cells will be much happier. The third brain basic is take a vitamin and mineral supplement. A lot of the nutrients and the fats require cofactors, the vitamins and minerals, to uh, have the body utilize them. And nobody's diet is going to be perfect. And even if it is the way commercial farms grow produce today, it's deficient in nutrients that used to be there 100 years ago. So take a high-quality vitamin and mineral supplement, the best you can afford, and um, and for people who have seasonal depression, uh, also add a lot more vitamin D3, not D2. D3 is the natural form, and it's much uh, more works better in the body. And uh, the recommended dose for vitamin D is only 400 IU a day. And for people who, like me, live in Connecticut, I was always depressed in the winter time, especially even worse than in the summer. And now I take 2,200 IU of vitamin D a day. But if you go to that level, be sure to have your D levels tested periodically. Um, researchers are saying you can go much higher than that, but I think you need to have tests periodically. Um, also, the B vitamins, which are so critical, B12, B6, all the B vitamins are really essential to the brain, and they're water-soluble, so the body doesn't store them. And so you need to make sure you're taking in all those B vitamins every day for optimum health, and that's why you'll get that in a good quality uh, vitamin and mineral supplement. So I consider those insurance. Um, the fourth brain basic is exercise. Exercise 30 minutes a day and don't call it a workout. Think of it as play. What did you used to love to do as a kid? Run around and play tag, jump rope, jump on a trampoline, go dancing, um, play tennis, play ball, do a sports. We've made what used to be fun into work. <laughs> And we really, the human body was designed to move. And exercise turns on a fat-burning gene. And it turns on a lot of other healthy genes. So it's really important. And um, so I consider that, and it lifts your depression instantly. If you're feeling blue and you go out for a 30-minute walk, you're going to feel a lot better. And it didn't cost you anything. So um, that that's item four in the brain basics. Item five is um, genetic testing, and we talked about the pyroluria and the methylation, and I'm going to give you a website um, for some of those later, but 
get tested for genetic causes if your family tree indicates that you are uh, dealing with genetic issues. My, I have a brother who's an alcoholic. I have a sister who has depression. My mother was bipolar. So alcoholism to me is um, people self-medicating for an undiagnosed um, imbalance of some sort, usually. Not always, but lots of times. And again, I think we can we can kind of think about this um, less in terms of you know some people having faulty genes or being their destiny is to be ill or something like that, and more about an interaction between um, individuality, really, our our yeah. uniqueness and the context that we live in. I mean, I I definitely understand the whole thing about things run in families, but there isn't necessarily a reason to believe. That because, for example, your family has a history of, of a of a diagnosis of bipolar or problems with alcohol, that you necessarily have that as a genetic destiny. I mean, there could be family dynamics that are k- passed down. There could be trauma that's passed down. It's a very complicated kind of thing. So I don't want anyone to think that that um, the point of view that I'm taking is to endorse a sort of a, a simplistic genetic. Uh, causality, and I, and I think that what you're talking about when you mentioned, you know, the um, exercise turning on genes that help fat, help burn fats, that's a real different way of looking at genetics, and I think that we've come to, uh, we've come to understand. So I just look at the genetic testing of the the four ones that have been known for so long as being uh, ruling that out. Um, because yes, there can be learned behavior, there can be all sorts of other things, but there also can be a genetic, um, in my family, I look at how the genes were combined differently. I have one brother who's fine, but, and then my sister just has depression and my other brother, I don't know, you know, he seems to have rage issues. So just because it's in the family tree doesn't mean that you're going to have it. And it also doesn't mean that there's nothing you can do about it. Um, so I'm just saying consider genetic testing if it's obvious that it's in the family and that will help you pinpoint what you need to do to offset that genetic um, combination. Or that you would have to take medication as a result of Don't have of to. That. No, you can all, the genetic causes, talks, causes that those four that I talked about, you don't need drugs to solve them. You take Vitamins, minerals, amino acids solves all of them. And this would also be um, inheritance that affects your whole wellness, not just some manifestation right. around mood or um, your mind, but just you know how your constitution as a whole being is affected by um, your inheritance and your genes. So. Well, the really interesting thing is I undermethylate, and they're now learning that that also undermethylation increases your risk of cancer and increases your risk of heart disease. So with the genome work, um, the genetic field is blowing wide open, but that hadn't occurred actually when I finished the book in 2005 and it came out in 2006. So the things that I'm talking about are really, really simple. They've been connected to uh, mental imbalances for 40 years. And so it's very simple to uh, compensate for having that um, genetic um, combination. Using the supplements and the therapies that you've talked about. Right. So, so what's, um, what are number six and seven on the number list? Number six is a lot of people who have um, um, mental disorders or mental illness, I guess I would prefer to call it. It's because it's to me it's an illness just like... Uh, cancer or heart disease. It's an illness and there's something you can do about it and there's physical causes and there's um, treatment that is doesn't have to be drugs. But uh, a lot of people have food allergies that are not diagnosed. They have a lot of gut issues. I think um, I mentioned to you that the serotonin, which is what the SSRIs are um, um, antidepressants are trying to hold in the synapses of the brain, 95% of serotonin is made in the gut, not even in the brain. So having your digestion work fine is really important. And it's believed that 60% of the population have digestive um, problems. 
and it's in in talking to the people that I interviewed whose stories are told in the book, um, I found that many of them had undiagnosed um, um, digestive problems, and at the clinic that I went to, the Pfeiffer Treatment Center, they automatically, in the natural supplements that they make for their patients, they automatically put in um, amino acids that help um, people to absorb the nutrients and to address the digestive issues. Yeah, I would have to really agree with that one as well because my own food allergy situation, as people who know me, um, I mean, I have a lot of limitations in my diet, which I'm glad about because once I learned what my allergies were, I started to feel better. Well, and did you do NAET? No, but it's on the list. <laughs> okay, because I got rid of... I, I got rid of um, the allergies that I had, and I had a, a dozen of them. The ones that came as a result of having leaky gut, which I'm not going to go into that right now, but um, a lot of people have inflamed gut that ca leads to leaky gut, which causes food sensitivities. The NAET eliminated and ended all those food sensitivities, but um, it, it did not totally eliminate my reaction to um, gluten, celiac disease, which is, I'm a type A blood type, and there is a wonderful book that talks about foods that are appropriate for different blood types. So the good news um, is that if people who do discover that they have food allergies, there are some ways to work with that and maybe overcoming the allergies. That's right. Um, uh, Gracelyn, we don't have a lot of time left, but mention um, number seven, which I guess is the okay. emotional, psychological well, dimension. The number seven was actually finding a doctor to help you ah, yeah. um, because this can be complicated. Not everybody has all the time that I had or loves to read. And I think that they can, um, the types of doctors are uh, important. They need to have been trained to use alternatives. Your, most of your conventional doctors are trained to use drugs or surgery, not very much about nutrition and healing other ways. So the doctors that can help people are naturopathic doctors, and they are called ND, orthomolecular doctors who tend to usually be MDs that have gone on to learn about alternatives. And, um, and what I suggest that people do is that they, um, if they can go online, they use a search engine, put in ND, and put in the name of their town or a city near them to see who's practicing near them. And then also orthomolecular, and put in the name of their town or city and, um, and see who pops up from that kind of a search. I You'll know that your uh, book also mentions acupuncturists, which has been really helpful. Yes, acupuncturists can help you a lot with allergies. Um, and also, there's. Um, uh, would you like me to give you some websites, or is there enough time? Yeah, if just a couple would be good. Okay, the the fish oils that are um, the ones by Dr. Stoll, who were uh, specifically formulated for brain chemistry, is Omega www. o m e g a b r i t e. dot com, and there is also a vitamin and mineral supplement that's specifically uh, created for um, people with mental illnesses, and it's uh, www.equlib.us. And those are in my book as well, but those are two uh, supplements that, would, that are specially formulated for people with mental illnesses, and they're quite helpful. Um, now, again, I, I don't think um, either one of us are, are saying that there's any kind of magic bullet or a one-size-fits-all um, solution, but I do think it's, it's really smart to do what you've done, which is to take a look at the research that's out there and to come up with some of the most likely best places to start and start experimenting with some of the things that um, you're talking about um, and seeing if that doesn't improve your health because so many people personally my experience has been and so many people that I've talked to have found that exploring holistic health approaches can really dramatically affect experiences they get ended up with a diagnosis of mental illness um, but the one piece that we don't 
have a lot of time, Gracelyn, and this has been really <laughs> interesting. It's such a great um, you know, topic. Your, your book is called Healing Depression and Bipolar Disorder Without Drugs, Inspiring Stories of Restoring Mental Health Through Natural um, Therapies. And we could do a whole other show, many shows about this. But one thing I do want to mention at the end is the whole issue of class politics, of money, because just the things that you've described are not going to be covered under people's insurance. A lot of people don't have insurance. And even if we start to get better universal health coverage in the U.S., it's not very likely that there's going to be adequate coverage for alternatives and for the actual treatments that people need. So I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about how we can maybe turn this into an activist issue, because I feel, and I'm sure you would agree, that health is a fundamental human right, and if people are not getting helped with mainstream treatments, and in fact the research says that a lot of the mainstream treatments are harmful, if there are people who do need to look to alternatives, that should be funded. It should not be about who's poor and who's rich and who can afford these things. So right. what, are, what are your thoughts about that? Well, I have uh, patients and consumers have much more power than they realize because how they choose to spend their money is, is where there's growth in, an, in the medical industry. And they, the medical industry pays attention to that. So if you start using alternative doctors who've been trained to do things holistically, then more doctors are going to get that training. And it'll be MDs as well because they're not going to lose market share and watch somebody take all their patients away. So they're going to go that direction ultimately. And then the schooling will change. But I think what you have to do right now and the interesting thing is that given the economic crisis that we're in, I actually think it could help because our healthcare system is broken and it's also bankrupt. Um, mental illness accounts for 15% of the cost of, of medical treatment in this country. Mental illness alone exceeds that the t total cost of cancers. So, I think that if people indicate they want to use alternatives and, and those of us who are now well and working as advocates for change say to the politicians and to the policymakers, listen, this alternative treatment, that's the other thing, this is cheap. I spent $3,000 out of pocket over a two-year period to figure out my own illness. Now I spend about $150 a month for supplements that keep me well. Now that sounds like a lot when it's coming out of your pocket, but when the government compares that to what they spend to provide drugs for people who are mentally ill and stay mentally ill for all of their life when they could be healed using alternatives, you're talking a lot of uh, impact on an economic level at a time when our government's really going to be open to saving money because they have to. We're in such a crisis. I think it's a really excellent point that what's what's threatened here is profits and the market of the mainstream treatments, but actually ultimately to society, this is going to be a lot less expensive approach in the long term. We will save money as a society the faster we embrace alternative health care. If people are listening, it's also important just to get to make connections with other people and get support and to be persistent because there may be healthcare practitioners in your area which seem like they might be too expensive, but you might be able to work out a sliding scale, you might be able to work out a barter, you might be able to find some way to get the treatment that you need. And remember that food is everybody has to eat and, and how you use your food dollars is where to start too. Gracelyn, can you tell us your email address and how to get in touch with in touch with you? Yes. My email address is G G U Y O L at AOL dot com. Gracelyn Guile, thank you so much for joining us today on uh, Madness Radio. Thank you very much, Will. This is Madness Radio, and I'm your host, Will Hall. We've been speaking with Gracelyn Guile. She is the author of Healing Depression and Bipolar Disorder Without Drugs, Inspiring Stories of Restoring Mental Health Through Natural Therapies. Uh, that's it for this week. Thanks a lot for tuning in to Madness Radio, and we'll see you next time. 
You've been listening to Madness Radio, voices and visions from outside mental health. Madness Radio broadcasts every Tuesday, 4 to 5 p.m. Eastern on Pacifica Affiliates, WXOJLPFM, Northampton, Massachusetts, and KWMD, Kasilov and Anchorage, Alaska. Co-produced by peer-run mental health communities, freedom-center.org and theicarusproject.net. Madness Radio is hosted by Will Hall. Music producer is John Rice, with technical assistance from Jeremy Lansman. Listen to our internet stream, podcasts, and show archives at madnessradio.net. If you have an idea for a story or guest on Madness Radio, to help get us broadcast on a station near you, or if you just want to share what's in your head, contact radio at madnessradio.net.